Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming, and uh, we're going to get started here. There will be a few more uh, arriving, I'm sure, after 8 p.m., but I'm not going to make the uh, early comers wait. And I'd like to welcome some of the guests and all of the students that are in our HVAC course. And just so you know, if you're a guest and this is the first time you've attended an online training, um, this is a follow-on of the review of Modules 1, 2, and 3, where we talked about temperature and theory of heat, uh, molecular motion, and refrigerant. And we covered the basic refrigeration cycle two weeks ago, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about the refrigeration cycle and get a little deeper into it. So if you're having audio problems, if you look at the top of your screen, uh, there should be a um, audio options. You, if you click on that, it'll allow you to call in by telephone. And sometimes if you have other folks on the Internet with your Wi-Fi, it may slow down the audio. All right, so we're going to get started here. Now I'm going to go to screen sharing. When I do that, I can't see any of the chats, but I'll check back for uh, questions as we go through. Okay, here we go. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about metering devices. And last week, or two weeks ago, when we talked about the refrigeration cycle, we didn't talk anything about the metering device, only that it was there. And so we're going to talk, look at a fixed orifice or, or a piston type device, then the refrigeration cycle with a fixed orifice, and how, how different and changing loads affect the refrigerant and the refrigeration cycle. Then we'll delve into the TXV valve and how it works in the refrigeration cycle. Then you'll be able to see the difference between the two. Now, tonight we're only going to talk about normal operating conditions. We're not going to do any troubleshooting, any problems that can occur. We're just going to look at the difference between a piston and a TXV. So this is the piston metering type device. It's very simple, pretty bulletproof. It's been used for quite a few years, and little if anything can go wrong with it. So that, that sits in a, a receiver right in front of the uh, evaporator coil. And then the top view is it is right here, and this is where the refrigerant gets metered down and uh, the pressure is dropped through the piston. So basically, it's just a straight through uh, hole, and there are different piston sizes for different tonnages of equipment. But we're not going to get into that, but manufacturers' specifications will have that for you. Okay, let's look at the refrigeration cycle. And we're talking about the metering device right now is being a fixed orifice, and that's just what it is. It's fixed, and it doesn't change much refrigerant flow going through the, the refrigeration line to the evaporator. So let's take a look. We're going to start a refrigeration cycle right here where we have a solid column of subcooled liquid coming up to our fixed metering device. Now this restriction, which is the metering device, immediately flashes the refrigerant to 75 percent liquid and 25 percent vapor and it goes from subcooled liquid immediately to its saturation temperature and pressure now remember when you're at saturation pressure and temperature with a refrigerant it's going to change state and if you add heat it's going to change state from a liquid to a vapor if you remove heat it's going to change state from a vapor to a liquid. So we are in it at the saturation point right here in the refrigeration cycle. And as this refrigerant is traveling through the evaporator coil, the fan motor blows the warm indoor air across the coil. Let's change colors here. That's hard to see. So it's going to blow warm indoor air across the evaporator coil. Now you remember from modules one and two that heat flows from a 
substance that has less heat, a more heat to a substance that has less heat. So we have indoor air temperature of 75 degrees. And when our refrigerant, in this example, flashes over to its saturation point, it's at about 41 degrees in this example. So that molecular, the molecular motion, which is heat, travels from the warm air blowing across the coil and is absorbed into the saturated refrigerant. Now, when it's at saturation point, the refrigerant's going to change state from liquid to vapor when heat is added. And that takes a tremendous amount of heat to boil or change the state of that refrigerant. So this evaporator coil is designed so that as the refrigerant travels through, it is changing state all the way through the coil to a specific point which is designed by um, the engineers. So the first part of this coil right here is absorbing a tremendous amount of heat as the refrigerant is changing state or boiling into a vapor. At a certain point in the evaporator coil, just before uh, the refrigerant exits it, the coil, it has changed state from its saturation point into 100% vapor. And, and it has absorbed all of the heat that it could possibly absorb to give you good cooling and 55 degree air coming out of your evaporator coil. At this point, any heat that is gained by the refrigerant is our sensible heat, and that is our superheat. And, and we have superheat so that when the refrigerant travels back to the compressor, the compressor has only vapor to compress because the liquid going back to the compressor will damage the valve plates and the compressor itself. So when we'll do this a little bit quicker. Okay, so solid column of sun cold refrigerant hits the first floor of this metering device, flashes. 75% liquid, 25% vapor. At this point, the coil is changing state, changing state, the amount of heat as it goes to the evaporator coil. At a certain point in the coil, is designed by the engine. We have boiled up all the refrigerant, and it goes from its saturations into a vapor state. And then it starts to pick up a little bit of additional heat as it travels through the last crater and outside. Make sure we have 100. So now we have superheated vapor coming in. Now, if you remember from modules one and two, the vapor and you increase the pressure pressure you also increase temperature so that's what what the compressor does to the refrigerated vapor it compresses it and it increases the temperature for example 50 degrees Fahrenheit to now we have 200 degree superheated vapor coming out of and at the beginning part of the condenser coil right here, we are desuperheating, so we're taking away all this uh, superheat that we added from this point of the compressor. We're going to desuperheat it at the beginning. And at the duration point of the refrigerant. Since we removed all the superheat, the sense sensible heat, about 125 degrees temperature and at the point. So on this refrigeration cycle, at saturation, now all of the heat can be gained. Sound, uh, call in on your phone and click up at the top of your screen, you should be able to get a number to call in on your phone. Okay, so let's get back.
the we have our superheated D superheated at this point the condenser coil and it's all of the sensible heat, which would be seventy five degrees of sensible heat, and it is dead. It's now at 125 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 30 degrees our outdoor air temperature. So all of the heat that we picked up over on this half of the refrigeration spot, we're going to shift doors at the condenser. And we and this happens because with the refrigeration at the saturation point of 125 degrees, it is has more heat energy than the outdoor 95 degrees. Remember, heat travels from substance. So we're starting to heat that we gain in here at the evaporator. So we're moving heat from a place where it is not wanted outside and dumping it to a place where it really doesn't matter. So as the refrigerant and saturation temperature travels through the condenser, it now and shedding all of this latent heat and is now condensing back down into its liquid form. The certain point in the condenser is designed again by the engineers. point into 100% liquid. And then the tail end of the condensing coil is where we and we subcool it because we want to have a solid column of subcooled liquid hitting our metering device again. If we don't have subcooling, if we didn't have subcooling, what happens is every time you have a little bit of a bend, for a long run of refrigerant piping, it starts to reduce the pressure of the refrigerant and it'll start to flash over into gas before it hits the meter in here to take care of any slight pressure to refrigerant line. Okay, if you have any questions now is the time to type it in, it'll pop in on the bottom right of my screen. You on. Okay, so we have now condensed our refrigerant back into sub cold liquid, and we are back to our uh, fixed orifice metering device. Now, in this the first example that we had, we're going to use this point right here as off point where we have boiled all the refrigerant off and it is now 100% vapor at, at this point right here. So what happens if our indoor air goes from 75 degrees Fahrenheit to 85 degrees Fahrenheit? Now we have more heat energy in the in the air that's being blown across our evaporator coil. So the same thing happens with as our first example, we have a solid column of subcooled liquid hits our fixed orifice metering device. It flashes from 75% liquid to 20 and 25% vapor, and it's at a saturation point, and it starts to change state or boil. So it changes state from it's changing state from liquid to vapor as it travels through the evaporator coil. It's picking up all of the uh, it possibly can, and it's a tremendous amount of heat required to change state. So that's where we get our refrigeration process as it travels through the coil. But now our air temperature is 85 degrees. So because our load has changed, so with a fixed orifice metering device, it, it's pretty much like a car. When you're driving your car and you have your foot on the gas pedal and you don't move the gas pedal, you go 55 miles an hour. If you start to go up a hill, you lose power, and if you go downhill, you gain power, and that's kind of how a fixed metering device is. It's pretty steady. It'll change a bit, but not much. So when there's a lot more heat energy that 
is being applied to the refrigerant, so it's going to boil off earlier on in the evaporator coil. So instead of boiling up at this point, it's boiling off here. So we start some of our cooling capacity as the indoor air temperature changes. So what you'll see is when the uh, room air temperature increases or the load increases, you're going to have a you're going to have diminished cooling capacity. And if any of you guys are already HVAC techs, you'll know that if you go to a fixed metering device call and everything is fine, but it's 106 degrees outside, the, the customers always saying that it's not cooling, it's not keeping our house at 72 degrees. It just it just physically can't do that. And that's because it's not at its optimal refrigerant off further further down. And then if let's say we drop drop the temperature from change the load from seventy five degrees to sixty five degrees. At this point we don't have as much heat evaporator coil and it this refrigerant boils off more slowly. And is it and because it boils off more slow slowly it will travel further through the evaporator coil and down the refrigerant line before it's completely boiled off. So you're going to have varying varying cooling capacities based on the load or the indoor air temperature of the refrigerant. And I saw someone pop the question up just a few minutes ago, and I missed it. Does, so does anyone have any questions about fixed metering devices? It's pretty simple. Uh, again, it, it is fixed, and if you think about your foot on the gas pedal of a car, and you're not moving it. It's it. You go at a fixed metering of fuel to the fuel and hills affect your speed. Okay, we're gonna go on. Okay, so this is a diagram of a Sporlin TXV. This is a more complicated metering device, but it, it's not overly complicated. It does the same thing as but it has a little bit more control, more like a cruise control on your car. So we have the sensing ball, which we'll take a look at in just a bit. We have the diaphragm. A lot of times this is called the power head, the valve body. This is the metering needle and orifice here, the inlet screen, and then there's a spring adjuster. And we're not going to talk about adjusting the superheat in this in this class. So let's take a look at an exploded view. First thing, we have our sensing bulb. This is connected with a small refrigerant tube to some people call it the power head thermostatic element. Most of the time I've heard it called power head. And this is what senses the temperature of the re refrigerant. And we'll go into this a little bit later, but there's refrigerant in this bulb that, that applies the pressure to the diaphragm inside the thermostatic element. And that the downward pressure of the thermostatic element pressure also up and down is transmitted to these push rods. Let's go back here. So right here the push rods are at the bottom of the sensing bulb, and as the sensing bulb senses temperature, it'll increase or decrease pressure these push rods up and down. And these push rods travel through body to down through this valve body, and they rest right on the pin carrier. So if you just slid these, this pin down through it, it would rest right on here and right here. And that pin carrier 
rests on top of the spring. So as the diaphragm in the thermostatic element moves up and down, it's going to move the pin carrier up and down. And on top of that pin carrier, and that's your cruise control. And this is what this is what purpose inside this EXB. So we'll get we'll go into this a little bit more, but that the, these are the parts sensing ball, thermostatic element, you have the push rods, the valve body is just a pretty much a solid piece of machined brass and copper with a valve seat and a pin carrier and then that this valve seat right here is what meters all the refrigerants. The rest of this is what controls the metering part. So let's take a look. Oh, I just want to show you the screen also. There's a screen that we looked at right here. It's an inlet screen. This is to keep the debris from flowing in here and getting um, caught in the valve seat and plugging up your TXD. So that's the one piece that was missing from from the TXD. So this is an MS screen just to keep debris from going through. Okay, so let's talk about how a TXD operates. TXD has one opening pressure and two closing pressure to maintain con constant superheat. And it, you know, we talked about the how the refrigerant in the system boils off further up or further down in the coil on a fixed orifice metering device, the TXV is going to maintain constant superheat, and which means it's going to meter the refrigerant flow so that it, you get the optimal cooling out of your uh, out of your coil. Okay, so let's take a look what what happens happens and how a TXV works. All right, so here's our sensing bulb. This is the refrigerant line that little tiny tube that is connected to our thermostatic element. And in this sensing bulb is usually the same refrigerant that is in the um, air conditioning system itself. So this bulb is partially partially filled with refrigerant. It's part liquid and it's part vapor which means it's at its saturation point. And when it's at its saturation point, any change in temperature is going to change the state of the refrigerant. So, And when we change temperature, we also change pressure. So when the sensing bulb senses warmer temperature, it increases pressure. That pressure is transmitted through the small little capillary tube, and it is pushing downwards on the diaphragm. Now, this downward pressure of the diaphragm is now transmitted to the pins, to the valve body, and it pushes down on the pin carrier, which pushes down on the, sp the spring, and it, let's get this, get a different color here. Okay, so... The increase in pressure pushes down on the diaphragm, pushes down on the pin push rods onto the pin carrier, and it's going to open up the orifice of the TXV, allowing more refrigerant to flow through. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. Okay, push rods push down on the pin carrier, and then it then it opens the valve a little bit, allowing more refrigerant to flow through. Okay. So the sensing bulb senses an increase in pressure. It increase, an increase in temperature. It increases the pressure pushes down on top of the diaphragm, pushes the push rods down onto the pin carrier, and it opens the valve up in response to the increase in pressure. Conversely, if it senses a decrease in, in temperature, senses a decrease in temperature, now we are going to 
change the state of this refrigerant back into liquid, decrease in temperature. It will decrease the temperature, which de decreases the pressure in the bulb. So now we don't have quite so much pressure pushing down on top of the diaphragm. It allows the spring to push back up and it closes off the refrigerant a little bit. So let's look at this. So R22 system at 54 degrees Fahrenheit, which we're going to, in this example, this will be a 54 degree Fahrenheit temperature at the sensing bulb is equivalent to 91 PSIG. So we have 91 pounds per square inch of bulb pressure pushing down on the diaphragm. That is our opening force of the TXV. And this is and this is how our TXV bulb is mounted at the outlet of the evaporator coil. So where it's it senses what's going on at the outlet of the evaporator coil, controlling what comes the refrigerant that comes in to the inlet of the evaporator coil. So ninety one PSIG from 54 degree temperature that the sensing bulb is sensing down here at the outlet of the evaporator coil equate it is pushed down on top of this diaphragm. Now, one of the closing forces of the TXV is the evaporator pressure. So, if our evaporator saturation point is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that means we have 67 PSIG of pressure pushing upwards on the bottom of the diaphragm, opposing the sensing bulb. And then the spring pressure helps maintain the balance of the of the superheat. And the way you get your superheat is you have your 91 PSIG opening pressure, 67 degree PSIG of closing pressure and it's designed in this example for 14 of pounds per square inch of superheat. Now the spring helps maintain equilibrium because uh, it allows the connection and the movement to happen between the um, pin carrier and the pins right here. If you didn't have the spring then it would just push down and, and it wouldn't push those pins and the valve seat back up. Okay, so that's what we have. We have one opening pressure, which is the bulb, sensing bulb pressure, and we have two closing pressures, which are the spring pressure here, and then the evaporator pressure pushing up on the bottom of the diaphragm. So the sensing bulb, you mount the sensing bulb at the outlet of the evaporator so that it can sense the temperature of the superheat heated vapor. So at this point in this diagram, we have the refrigerant is it's just hit the point where it's gone from a saturation point and now it's completely vapor and it's starting to pick up sensible heat and superheat at this point. So you all, so the sensing bulb was mounted at the outlet, very outlet of the evaporator. All right, so when you mount the sensing bulb on the outlet of the evaporator, it's important that you have it mounted properly on the suction line. And for all manufacturers, factory recommended TEV bulb replacement or TXV bulb replacement is should be placed between 4 and 8 o'clock on any refrigerant line bigger than seven eighths. And if it's less than seven eighths, you want to put it between four and eight o'clock, but never on the bottom, and here's why. That sensing bulb needs to sense the temperature of the refrigerant going through the, uh, the pipe right here. And if you mount it on top, there's going to be warmer vapor on the top, and you're going to get an erroneous reading up here. And there's oil on the bottom, and that doesn't allow very um, good response 
so the temperature changes. It, it kind of insulates the bottom here, and the temperature changes aren't transmitted so readily through that oil. So the best thing that you can do, and remember this, the best, let's go back. If you if you mount your sensing bulb at four or eight o'clock, and, and or directly on the sides, works well for all size pipes. So you don't want to be on the bottom, you don't want to be mounted on the top, you want to be mounted on the side of the pipe. Now the sensing bulb, when you it has to sense the temperature of the refrigerant, the evaporator pipe, you need to make sure that you have a very tight and secure fastener to hold the um, sensing bulb on the refrigerant line so that it can it transmits heat more readily between the two. In this example, it shows radiator clamps, but the uh, most TXVs have mounting straps made out of brass, and other manufacturers also have clamps that will clamp it on there. So good connection between the sensing bulb and the evaporator. And you don't want to mount it where you have a raised joint or a coupling or a 90 or any other kind of fitting because you get a gap right here where the sensing bulb doesn't have any contact and then you're going to get erroneous readings. So that's important to pay attention to. The other thing you need to pay attention to when you're mounting your um, sensing bulb on a refrigeration line is that the capillary tube needs to be at the top. And if you, because if you don't do this, what happens is the liquid refrigerant flows out of the sensing bulb to the um, head of the valve here, and then there's not very much liquid for the bulb to boil off. So if anything, uh, if you, it just doesn't respond properly and it doesn't give you the wide range of motion. In fact, I've seen it where, um, in, where it has frozen up a refrigerant line and, and has really affected the cooling capabilities when this is mounted um, upside down. So just don't do that. Okay, so here we are. Oh, any questions? I saw a couple pop up. They pop up and down so quick. I think the one question I saw is, is the metering device um, flashed it over to 75% liquid to 25% vapor. It depends on what, where the metering device is when things start to operate. It takes about 15 minutes for um, a TXV to reach its equilibrium point and start the meter refrigerant properly because the sensing bulb doesn't respond immediately to changes in temperature and, and it just takes a while to settle down. So 10 to 15 minutes of continuous running before you do any type of measurements and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at a TXV under normal operating conditions. So we have a, and this is our TXV right here. Okay, uh, I got a question here. Scott wanted to know, do all TXVs have the same rating? I'm assuming you're talking about superheat, and no, they don't. Um, different manufacturers have different superheat settings, and some TXVs uh, have adjustments on the bottom where you can affect the, uh, or you can change the superheat. And Scott, I'll get back with you on that because I'm not quite quite understanding that question. We'll get to that at the end here. Okay, so let's get going. We have a solid column of subcooled liquid coming from the condensing coil into the EXV. And it goes it, it goes through the valve and the valve seat of the TXV. It it does the same thing as a Fixed orifice metering device in that it it see my pen's not drawn there. Okay, I'm hold on just one second. Okay, so now we have a solid column of subcooled liquid coming through the TXV. And it 
immediately drops the pressure. And if the spot has been operating for about 15 minutes, we're going to flash to 75% liquid and 25% vapor. So at this point, coming out of the TXV and the fixed metering device, we're pretty much in the same state, uh, pretty much the same pressures. And we are at a saturation point. So we are changing state, changing state from liquid to vapor as we pick up all of the heat from the indoor, indoor air. And it changes state, changes state, boiling off, picking up is all that heat energy that the changing of state absorbs. And at a certain point in the evaporator coil, we have now boiled off all of the refrigerant. It's changed state completely from the saturation point to 100% vapor. And we start to pick up our superheat and back to the compressor it goes. At, at this point, this is, we'll, we're going to say that it's exactly the same as the fixed orifice. They're designed to, under optimal conditions, to have a certain amount of superheat. And all of the refrigerant boiled off at this point. Now, so that everything is the same at this point. And in, in, in our example of the fixed orifice, our, the temperature of our indoor air increased to 85 degrees. So we're going to we're going to do that as well. Now remember, we have our sensing bulb is mounted at the outlet of the evaporator, and it follow and it has this capillary tube, and it comes up here, and it's mounted down on the top of the TXV right here. You remember that that diaphragm senses the sensing bulb. Those those push rods push down through there, and it opens and closes the valve in response to the temperature of the refrigerant line right here. So our temperature increases to 85 degrees, and in in this example, we're going to go from 75 to 85 in a flash. It, it doesn't normally do that, but it's easier to show you. So this is the point where the refrigerant boils off and is designed to, and we have 75 degree room air. So in a flash, the room air increases to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we, at, when that happens, the refrigerant that's traveling through this point is still at saturation. It's boiled off, boiled off, boiled off, changing state, changing state, picking up heat, picks up heat as we go through. And because there's a, a lot more heat, a, a higher load, at, it's going to boil off completely before it hits the point where it was designed to. And it starts to pick up from this point on sensible heat. So it's picking, it's heating up this refrigerant line more than it was designed to. Now this sensing bulb is going to sense that increase in heat. When you have, when you increase the temperature of the refrigerant, which is in this bulb right here, you increase the pressure. So as, as this refrigeration line heats up, so does the sensing bulb, which increases the pressure of the refrigerant in the bulb. And because this is a capillary tube that flows through here, it transmits that pressure to the top of our TXV. And what it does is it pushes that diaphragm down, pushing those push rods down, which opens up the valve, which opens up the, the size of the orifice or the size of the valve opens up to allow more refrigerant to flow through. So it senses that increase in temperature, transmits it via pressure to the top of the TXV, and it allows more refrigerant to flow through. So eventually, instead of boiling off here, it's going to allow enough refrigerant to flow through so that it boils off at its design point, and now we have maintained 
proper cooling and proper superheat, even though our temperature has increased to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So once again, if there's a, an increased load, the sensing bulb will sense the increase of temperature on the refrigerator, the outlet of the evaporator coil, transmit it through the capillary tube to the top of the TXV, pushing down on the diaphragm, opens up the valve, lets more refrigerant through, and it comes back to equilibrium. Now, in real life conditions, the we're not going to go from 75 to 85 degrees. We're going to go from 75 degree load to maybe 76 degree load as it, as it it starts to get warmer in the afternoon, and the wind, the sun starts shining in the windows, and and the indoor air increases in temperature. So, the sensing bulb is going to sense every degree of increase in this refrigeration line and transmit that increase in temperature to the top of the of the TXV and and make small adjustments to the amount of refrigerant going through the system so that it maintain, maintains the proper superheat and the amount proper amount of refrigerant to allow uh, designed amount of cooling over a higher temperature load or a higher heat load. So what happens when the temperature decreases? It's just the opposite. When the temperature starts to decrease, it gets you get into the evening, it's been 95 degrees all day, the sun sets and it starts to drop, temperature starts to drop. What happens is the refrigeration, the uh, refrigerant continues to go through here picking up heat, but now since there's a, a reduced amount of heat load, it's going to it's going to travel a little bit further through the evaporator coil before it starts picking up superheat and it's all boiled off, and the temperature of of the refrigeration line at the outlet of the evaporator is going to decrease. So a decrease in temperature equates to a decrease in pressure in the sensing bulb that's transmitted through the capillary tube to the top of the TXV, and it relieves some of the opening pressure on the top of the sensing bulb. That spring pushes the push rods back up, and it closes the valve a little bit so that it now meters back the refrigerant so that you have proper cooling even when the temperature drops. Um, a TXV is going to maintain your proper subcooling. I would it, it depends on the manufacturer, but usually the manufacturer's charts stop at about 95 degrees. Um, the design temperature for air conditioning is really not 110 degrees when it's 110 degrees in Nevada. It's 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 not going to operate as over that wider range of um, conditions. All right, so any questions on the TXV opening pressures, closing pressures, fixed orifice? Do I need, does anybody want me to go through that again? One, one last thing. What happens over here with the on the cond condensing side is basically the same as with the fixed orifice, it's it you really see the difference in in what happens on the um, evaporator side of the system. Okay, time for questions. Let's, let's flash back here. Any questions for me? All right. Well, I would encourage everyone to um, send me an email if you, any questions pop up after the webinar. If you have any any request about what you would like to learn, what we need to cover, or or something that's not clear, from time to time I'll do these free webinars. We we do these for the um, for our class often. So I I just like to thank you all for coming. If there's anything I can do to help further your HVAC education, it's what I love, and um, I'm here to help you. All right, gents, I will um, be in touch. I thank you very much for attending, and I will see you on the next
webinar. And, it, and I'll just hang out here for a few minutes if any of you want to um, ask any questions. You're welcome, Karen and Scott. Thanks, David. Hi, Jeff. On the electro okay, electronic expansion valves, that is more in the commercial refrigeration. We do have a class on that, but um, that is a good topic. Those are fairly new also, but they use them in um, commercial refrigeration a lot. You're welcome, Zahid. All right, Jordan, if you have any questions, um, shoot me a message on the um, on the website. All right, Jamie. See you later. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, Corey. Next webinar, I'm going to have to check the calendar. Um, we have, uh, I think it's two weeks from Monday, if I'm not mistaken, is part three of our schematic reading. It's on the website there. Okay. Hey, Mike. Um, it's when I was talking about flash gas. Hang on, Mike. I'll get I'll get back with you on that if you want to hang on. See you later, Corey. You're welcome. Thanks, Luis. Yeah, hang on, Michael. I'll, I'll talk to you about flash gas here in just a bit. You're welcome, John. Okay, Michael, let's go back to the screen sharing and 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 we'll we'll see if I can get back to where I think we were on the flash gas. All right. So then we'll go back. And we'll go we'll go to this one. Okay, John, now if you have a question, you can type it in. It'll pop up quickly at the bottom of my screen. So, okay, I think this is what you were talking about, or what I was talking about in your question. When I talked about, was it about subcooled liquid, where it's subcooled to this point? Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Michael, flash gas. Is that what you're talking about? Are you still with me, Mike? Okay. So were you talking about um, this point right here when I w when we were in the webinar about we want to make sure that we have subcooled liquid going up here to the metering device so we don't get flash gas? Is that the question that you had? Okay. Okay. So here's here's what happens. This is a little bit more advanced, but I'll, I'll see if I can explain this properly. If if we don't subcool this liquid, which means we're going to take away 15 or 20 degrees of heat, and we're going to be 15 or 20 degrees below the saturation point of the refrigerant. If we just have, if we have no subcooling, right, right here, any elbow like this reduces pressure a little bit. So if you have a 
joint that's not braised properly, not reamed properly. You have um, fittings, 90 degrees, causes a slight pressure drop. If we're only a few degrees above, or I'm sorry, a few degrees below the saturation point, it's going to start, it's going to hit this elbow and it's going to drop pressure a little bit. And then it's going to hit this pressure and it's going to drop, or this elbow and drop pressure a little bit. And if there's only a little bit of subcooling, just a little bit of pressure drop is going to start to put the refrigerant back into a saturation point and it's going to start um, changing state and boiling before it hits the metering device. Now we're, instead of having 75% liquid and 25% vapor, you know, in an extreme case, you're going to have 50% liquid, 50% vapor, and then you're going to lose your cooling capacity. And even if it's a straight shot on the line set, a 3 8 inch line set, there's friction in this line set, and that reduces the pressure, which will start make it bring it back to its saturation point, and it'll start boiling off in this line, and that reduces it. And and it, re it doesn't wreak havoc, but it 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 really affects the TXV because of the it starts swinging it back and forth. Does, it, does that answer your question about flash gas? Okay, and you know a lot of times you can. If that's happening, okay, okay, Scott, okay, adjusting the TXV, that's probably the last thing you want to do. I want you to think about this. If you add refrigerant or adjust the TXV, um, it's 15 minutes in between an adjustment, and you're talking quarter turn adjustments. and TXVs rarely change um, when they fail. They don't change superheat by a degree or two or three or four. It when they fail, they pretty much fail open or they fail almost closed and don't adjust any superheat. Um, they do make valves where you can adjust the superheat, and you see that a little bit more often in. A refrigeration application and and some residential but but that's the last thing you want to do is adjust the superheat you're going to have to find out there's other things that affect superheat um, in a system and you know if you have a plug dirty coil evaporator coil a dirty fan motor and and things are really bad it will it can affect the superheat on a txv but usually you don't have to adjust them Hopefully that answered your question. Did it? So I'm going to say, Scott, never, I'm not going to say not ever, but rarely do you want to adjust the TXV. You'll find that you'll be chasing superheat all over the map for three hours trying to get it right. But it's probably not the TXV. Any other questions? All right, then. Okay, you too, Michael. Thank you. All right, gents. Have a good evening. Um, I will send a message to you when it is um, when we have our next webinar.